Okay, so we'll be talking about uh, tasks in, uh, in judgment data collection. Um, just uh, where we um, finished the previous video was uh, basically this overview of things that you need to have in place in order to uh, start uh, formal data collection. So we'll just briefly come back to that. What are the preconditions for formal data collection? I will show you one uh, example of a, of a hypothesis that we can test uh, using formal data collection of judgment data and then we'll exemplify some, uh, some specific tasks that you can use uh, and really the purpose of, of this is for you to have you know, sufficient notion of these um, tasks that you can implement them in, in your own experiments that you design. So, uh, the slide that we uh, have already seen in the previous uh, video, uh, basically the things that need to be clear uh, before you start collection, your, your data collection or constructing tools for your data collection. So you need to know what, what you're asking, what you're uh, trying to uh, find out and what is the hypothesis, what are you trying to prove or disprove. Um, then what are the, what are your variables and uh, or what type are they? How do you, how you measure these these uh, factors, these aspects of, of data that you're collecting? Um, what is the sample size? So how many data points you need um, or you want to collect? And what statistical test you will be applying to the results? These things you need to have um, clarity on before you start. Now, um, for most things, uh, it's really it's really topic uh, dependent, and it's something that we will not be discussing here explicitly. Um, but in order to just to give any examples, I need a toy example of a study. So I will I will just briefly introduce a research question and some hypotheses, so that we can. Uh, we have something to work with and to, to design tasks for. So this is really a toy example, uh, but it is actually an actual topic from uh, English word formation. So basically uh, English nominalizations from, from adjectives, so the, the adjectival nominalizations have different affixes, you know that. Uh, if you speak English, or especially if you learned English, you learned that, you know, it's I don't know, width and length, and but it's darkness, but it's stupidity. And, and all these are derived from adjectives, so it seems, but, uh, but with different affixes. So when we look at the really real top of the, of the um, frequency list of these affixes, at the top there are two. So there is ness, uh, which is absolutely the most pre frequent nominalizer in English. Um, uh, the adjectival nominalizations, and then you have iti. Uh, and very often, so, so examples are darkness, hardness, vividness, uh, stupidity, acceptability, sanity. Very often, uh, ness is described as more general and uh, able to combine with all kinds of adjectives, whereas iti is specific to items that uh, English got from romance, so, so Latin specific uh, items. So this is true, if, and if speakers really know this, so, you know, iti has some kind of special feature, whereas ness is just general, um, that allows us to formulate some hypotheses. So one hypothesis is that um, if you take a word which typically has iti, and then instead of iti you put ness, you should get a relatively okay word. Whereas if you take a word that typically takes ness, and you put it instead, the result should be relatively bad because in the in the latter case, but not in the former case, you have something like a mismatch. You have you combined something that is not marked as Latinate with the Latinate uh, affix. So what does this mean, mean specifically? It means that uh, nominalizations like stupidness should be more acceptable, relatively okay, than nominalizations like hardity, right? Hardness. And then we turn that into hardity, that should be relatively bad. Uh, but stupidness, instead of stupidity, should be relatively 
Okay, and then we are we, we should be able to test that. Um, uh, this I cannot I cannot work with just one hypothesis. So I will based on the same statement from the literature, I will, I will, I will try to give you uh, two more hypotheses. Uh, Again, these are really toy, uh, toy examples, uh, but we really need some toy examples in order to to uh, construct some some uh, example tasks. Uh, so the second, so based based on the same idea, ness is general, it is specific. Uh, we can also make the the assumption that uh, if you have an adjective that combines with neither, it is. Or, or NES, basically NES should still be better with this than it. So we have intelligent that gives intelligence in um, most commonly. Um, and then intelligentness should be a bit better than intelligentity. That's, that's what follows from the idea that NES is more general. That was our second hypothesis, and then our third hypothesis is if you if I give you something that doesn't even really exist as an adjective, so a non-adjective, an, an adjective that I just made up for the purpose of the experiment, and I ask you to combine it with the um, with a, a word with a, sorry, I, I ask you to turn it into an, uh, a noun, and I present it to you as an adjective, then uh, you should prefer ness to it because uh, presumably things that you never heard of you cannot know that they are that they are Latinate. So uh, something like okram, uh, then okramness should be better than okramity. That that should be the the uh, hypothesis. Okay, so now uh, basically let's look at some tasks in which we are trying to to uh, test some of these some of these uh, hypotheses. So we'll look at, at three types of judgment, judgment tasks. So yes, no task, forced choice task, and uh, Likert scale task. Basically, yes, no task is indeed what it sounds like. So I give you a word and I ask you, is this good, yes or no? Uh, so I... Um, this is this is for testing uh, our hypothesis one. So something like validness, we're interested in because it's validity, right? Uh, most commonly. So something like validness, we're interested in how people, uh, whether people would would accept this as a word or not. And you put these people in front of the uh, of a very binary choice. So it's either they have to say either yes or no to validness, and that is that is uh, one. Um, experimental item in this, and that's one like one task within this task, uh, within this experiment, one specific, uh, yeah, uh, stimulus uh, in this experiment. So basically, what are the advantages of uh, of the yes no task? It's easy to deploy, right? It, it's very easy to deploy. Uh, people understand immediately what you what you want them. Uh, to do, uh, and they, you know, they they have to answer it somehow, and then they answer it, uh, and 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 uh, you have some uh, result that is uh, also easy to process, right? So so you can you can just like count the the for instance the average of all uh, items uh, where. Uh, so, so of all the yes answers or something like that, and and uh, that we, or the ratio of yes yes answers, and that's, that already gives you some some uh, well gi gives you gives you something to compare uh, something something to compare this item to other items, the responses to this item to responses to other items. So quite a quite um, easy to process. But a big disadvantage is that it's very Binary, obviously. So you you can either either uh, answer yes or no. Um, so you may miss some qualitative boundary. Imagine that you have a speaker of English who basically just goes no uh, whenever it's a word that doesn't sound perfectly familiar and you know 100% in every dictionary uh, to them. Then they then they will just uh, reject all your items. 
uh, that you're interested in. It, they would reject uh, validness and they would reject heredity and uh, they would in, in, in reject uh, intelligentness and basically you will you, you wouldn't have anything to compare because everything would be every all the items would be rejected in all cases. So that would not be that would that, then the yes no task would not work. Uh, although the speaker might feel some differences, but but the, this task would just not catch these differences. Something where you basically, I mean, one one of the ways to resolve this is to to enforce having differences by doing a forced choice task. So now you're not asking your speaker to um, uh, evaluate a single form, but you make them cho choose between two forms, and they have to choose one. So so choose which word sounds better in this context, and then you go, they are so okram that they are not even aware or there, and then they have to say either okramness or okramity. And they cannot not choose one, and they cannot choose both, they really have to choose uh, one. Um, so the advantage, again, really easy to deploy, and suited to identify qualitative differences, right? You are, you are, if you get... Uh, if there is a quality difference, this might very probably uh, going to show up in uh, in a forced choice task. What is the what are the disadvantages? First, it cannot reliably measure sizes of difference. So, uh, if there is no clear um, contrast, so if it's not true that you know all speakers uh, prefer awkwardness or all speakers prefer awkwardity. Then it's really hard to figure out, you know, how much, I mean, you have no information, basically, of how much they disliked, whether it was a difference between, you know, like if you imagine on a, on a scale from one to five, whether they choose the one that was, you know, uh, two uh, over the one with, that was one, or the one that was five over the one that was one. Uh, so, so basically, you cannot really, you cannot, you don't really catch that. You cannot, you don't get really any idea of the sizes of differences, you just get the difference. Um, and basically, uh, uh, related to that, no impression of the general scale. So you have no idea on what scale they, they evaluated this. Uh, again, whether it was whether they were very close together or they're like entirely, entirely different in terms of acceptability. You just get no information about this. And then again, so, so this, these are, this is also, this overview is structured in such a way that, uh, that kind of, uh, you get in the, in the following one, you get, uh, some new problems, but you get solutions to the, 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 the problems of the previous, uh, previous approach. In a, uh, Likert scale task, you basically ask people to tell you, uh, how they feel about an item on a scale. So on a scale, for instance, from one to five. five. Uh, so now we are asking the speaker to tell you uh, how they feel about uh, stupidness uh, as an item, and they know that uh, one is totally unacceptable, and they know that, I'm not sure whether you can see next to five, there is uh, totally acceptable. Uh, so there you can, uh, you can, um, it is clear on what scale, and you can get you get an impression uh, on what scale they are evaluating this because you you set the scale, you decide the, the, the scale. So this is really suited to identify size of differences. Um, the disadvantage that is one of the most hotly di 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 discussed topics in uh, the literature is. Uh, that there is non-uniform interpretation of the numeric scale. You can never be sure that people really uh, so so first consider the differences between these these points on the scale as equal, and also you can never be sure what it what what the scale really means to them. So the, these are some uh, things where there may be some some individual uh, differences that might be really frustrating. Okay. Uh, just briefly about the presentation mode. So basically, uh, you can, uh, uh, you know, classical printed questionnaire uh, that that you might first think of, but maybe not because you you might be of a of a different generation has some some issues, uh, which is why we might want to use uh, a computer based uh, a computer based task. 
So in uh, the following uh, video, I will tell you more about this.